We're in a series of messages where we are identifying Christ in the Old Testament, teaching the Bible as one story from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The more we understand the Bible is one story, the more we connect to the grand theme of God. And we need to be connected to that because at times we become, well, caught up and distracted from the plain and plain things in Scripture. So we are pursuing Christ as he's revealed to us in the Old Testament. And this is, I think, is the fourth message in the series, and today we're going to be talking about Noah and the flood. And so I point your attention to Genesis 6-8 as a verse that's really thematic for what I'm going to share this morning, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace for all of you who have been trained on the notion that the Old Testament is law and the New Testament is grace. We are before the law in the Old Testament here. The law has not even been given yet. And Noah found what? He found grace in the eyes of, of, of the Lord. Understanding that the story of the Bible has always been about grace. We are a fallen people. We are a damned race. We are destined for judgment except God has shown us His grace. And that grace is revealed to us in Jesus, but not in Christ alone. We find from Genesis to Revelation the story of grace, and may God help us today as we begin to track how the New Testament treats the flood because it gives us insight into God's great story. Noah found grace. Noah matters to New Testament people. For those of you who have locked him up in that little blue Bible story book that you bought for your kids, I want you to open the pages and unlock them and let them out. Noah matters to New Testament people. Noah matters. He's not locked up in the Old Testament. Jesus drags him into the New Testament in two of his Gospels, 24th chapter of Matthew, 17th chapter of Luke, both recording Jesus alluding to Noah and what Noah has to say to us in these last days. And if we only had those two portions of Scripture in all of the New Testament, you might think, well, it's a little bit of a stretch to talk about Jesus and Noah and any kind of connection. But Jesus reaches back and drags Noah into the New Testament, but he's not alone. Peter, in both of his letters, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, speaks of Noah and the flood, and he speaks to New Testament issues. We'll look at those in a bit, but he speaks to New Testament issues. So there's a little bit more there with two passages that deal with Jesus and Matthew and Luke reaching back to Noah. And then you've got Peter, and he reaches back to Noah under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and drags him into a New Testament context, but that's not all of it. The author to Hebrews in the 11th chapter and verse 7 he reaches back also and he brings Noah from the obscurity of the Old Testament. He drags him front and center in New Testament times, especially in dealing with a Jewish audience. And he says, Noah matters. So we've got to give some attention to Noah and the flood this morning. The flood is not an isolated Bible story. And that's how, most, that's how it is most often told. All of the Bible is one great story. God has set a massive stage on which to tell his redemption story. It's a massive, think of the size of this stage and then extend it almost to eternity on both sides or infinity of, on both sides. Just keep extending it. That's the stage that God has set on which to tell one overarching story. But we carve up the play into so many parts and so many scenes that people lose track of the story. And with Noah and with others, what we do is we take their little story and we just kind of set it aside and it becomes a Bible story and it really doesn't have anything theologically to say to us or anything practical to say to us. And if we would just step back a little bit and look at the story as how it fits with all of God's story, 
well, then it really ministers to us. You see, we tend, we tend, especially people who have any theological bent, we tend to look at the Bible under a microscope. We want to parse every verb, and that's important. Getting the language right and the intent, that's, that's, it's, it's important. But we get so into making sure that we've, we see everything, we examine it through the microscope. Before long, we gather others around us who look through microscopes, and we get together at conventions when we, where we argue about all the things that we see as we look through our little microscopes. And we argue about the implications of all of the minutia of theological bits and pieces and then we develop expertise in those little things that we see through the microscope, and our differences in opinion drive us into different camps. And so some gather, and they're all about, you know, this particular issue, and others gather, and they're all about this particular issue and this particular issue, and before long, within the body of Christ, rather than us gathering together and seeing the overarching picture of all of the Scripture, we have segregated ourselves into all of these little microscope camps where we stare through our microscopes, we are driven then into a bunch of what I'll call theological corrals. You got the Pentecostal corral, you got the charismatic corral, and that's got a lot of sub-corrals in it, and then you got the Baptist corral, and that's got a couple hundred sub-corrals in it, and you got a few more corrals over here where everyone comes together, and we all unite over what we see as we all agree looking through the microscope. And in looking through the microscope, sometimes we forget that the body of Christ is bigger than just the things that we examine. How many of you are aware that there are going to be some people in heaven who don't agree with us on every theological point? Are you good with that? Because some, some of us grew up in churches where we were led to believe that only we were going to make it. And maybe a few of those other ones, but certainly not those ones. What's that about? It's about people having theological arguments, staring through their little microscopes, and divorcing whatever they see, divorcing it from the big picture that God tells from Genesis to Revelation. And so when we do that, and we've built all our little corrals in the body of Christ, we look somewhat like a dirty, nasty feedlot. You know, you've seen a feedlot before with all of the corrals and all the animals pinned up out there. That's what, we, that's what we look like instead of a magnificent landscape that flows with color and sky and water and life. If we, the church, cannot see God's big picture, how can those who encounter us see Christ in us? How can they? So I want to exchange the microscope for the telescope. I want us to quit kicking around the pebbles and look to the heavens and see the majesty and the power of God's big story. To see that story written by men under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So it's not just what men think. They were inspired by the Spirit to give us truth and revelation. It's the greatest story ever told, and it comes down, it really comes down to this simple, this simple proposition that God has come to his broken creation and broken into that broken creation through his Son to save all who will believe on him and ultimately then to restore all that has been lost, to restore all that has been broken. This is the story. Salvation. Jesus said it so clearly. For this reason, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why I say Noah matters, because Noah helps us see the big picture. Now, when we talk about Noah, we really have no choice but to view the flood from a great distance, because we're at least 2,400 years away from it. And we have what the Bible says about the flood and no other contemporary writings or contemporary histories of it. So we don't really have a whole lot to go on. So we see it from the distance. And yet it is from the distance as we look at the flood that we see it not as an isolated catastrophe, but rather as a centerpiece of the Bible's great story, which is salvation through grace in Jesus Christ. You say, well, I don't see that in Noah's story. Hang with me this morning. Because I can almost hear the protest. Hey, wait a minute, Pastor. <laughs> you are proposing that there's Christian messaging going on here in Genesis two or three millennia before 
Christ. Really, Pastor? Christ in the flood? To which my reply this morning is, well, yeah. Exactly. So I hope you'll hang with me this morning. You see, Jesus, Peter, and the author of Hebrews point us to the flood to get the big picture. The flood serves then as a type or a foreshadowing in the Old Testament of a New Testament reality. There's a lot of this in the Old Testament. You have to be careful with it because sometimes people don't do their, they just don't do their legwork when it comes to typology and they end up with all kinds of, of um, what should I say, conclusions that are really aren't scripturally based. But typology is worth studying in the scripture where you'll find something in the Old Testament that gives you a picture of something that is coming in the new. And we have that in the flood. The use of typology or seeing New Testament truth revealed in Old Testament stories is clear even in Paul's writing. Paul wasn't speaking about the flood, but in 1 Corinthians, which is New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul was speaking about the Exodus, and listen to what he says. He gives all the turmoil of the Exodus and all the things that happened in the Exodus, and he takes this whole passage talking about Old Testament truth, and he said, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. They're examples to us. The interesting thing is that word that is translated examples is typoi, and typoi is just as adequately interpreted as type. In the Old Testament, you find a foreshadowing in type of something that is coming as a reality in the new. The flood is all of that. The flood is a clear picture of two things. Judgment and grace. Just look at the big picture. What happened in the garden? Man fell. So no longer a recipient of all of God's blessing, he became a recipient of what? The curse. And judgment came into the world. Creation has fallen. God's judgment and wrath is rightfully poured out. And yet in the midst of it all, To those who will look for him, to those who will call upon him, he will be found. And what does he give them? He gives them his grace. Judgment and grace. Would you say that judgment and grace are both New Testament principles? And yet you find them throughout the entire Bible. So when you look to the flood, you see both judgment and grace. Christ, we know. Christ is both our righteous judge. He is also the author of salvation. He's the final truth on judgment and on salvation, our judge and savior. So with that, all that said, and that background laid, let's go back to Genesis chapter six. What happened in Genesis chapter six through eight? Well, about 1600 years have passed since Adam was thrown out of the garden. Remember, Adam is taken out of Eden and he can no longer live in that place of blessing. He is taken out of Eden and 1,600 years pass by. In that 1,600 years, population has exploded in the earth. We know this because of the generations, and also we know this because in many of the genealogies that are generally based on the firstborn, in many of the genealogies, we are told how old some of these men were when their sons were born. So there was a population explosion in the earth because right now, Right now, most men who will, who will um, sire children, uh, it's going to be within maybe a 20 or 30. How many of you men would like to be, well, let me not go there because I'm just thinking that could stir up all kinds of fights over lunch. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's a few women who are just going, yeah, don't go there. Stop and think about it though. Most of us, I, I, my children were born within four years. Four years. And I was done. But when we look to the Old Testament, we find that some of these people are living 500, 600, 700, 800, 900 years. Some of them are are giving birth to sons at 500 years. We are only given the firstborn in the genealogy, so we have no idea how many children they had and how many children's children. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how confused genealogies were? You could literally be 100 years old and go over to somebody's house to celebrate the birth of your great uncle. (laughs) 
Most of us aren't going to be around, right, when, I mean, it just doesn't work. Because in our culture, we only live for what? We've got 70, 80, 90 years. Maybe, maybe we reach the century mark, and, and all of those are not childbearing years. It's certainly not from men giving birth or, or being able to sire children. But in the Old Testament, you've got a lot of children being born through these years. You've got a population explosion as until disease enters into the world and grows, and then, of course, all of the corruption and the pollutions and everything else that come along. Men live a lot longer. And so you've got a population explosion. Two lines of genealogy are chased, are, are chased down from the early chapters of Genesis, only two. One is the line of Cain. You remember Cain was the murderer who murders his brother Abel, and God judges him. God judges him. Cain goes out, and we are given, we are given in the Scripture, uh, the line of Cain. And what became of his children, they were creative, they were inventive, and all of that. But nowhere in the line of Cain, anywhere, is there any mention whatsoever of God or godliness, or righteousness, or purity. What we have with Cain is a very profane man who gives birth to profane children who are noted in the Scripture for their wickedness and for their evil. So you have the line of Cain. Then there's a second genealogical line that is given to us in the Old Testament in, in Genesis, and that is the line of Seth. Remember, Seth was the son that was born after Abel was killed? And God gave Adam and Eve Seth. And we don't know much about Seth, but this is what we know. In the fourth chapter of Genesis, verse 36, it says, From that time on, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. From Seth's line, you have a sensitivity to God and godliness. And so you, you have the line of Cain and you have the line of Seth. Now, Seth, in the, in the line of Seth, you have a son born who's named Enoch. Remember him? The one, the Bible says, and Enoch lived righteously before God. He walked with God and he was no more for the Lord took him. We're given insight into this interesting man who lived in such righteousness before God. God said, I'm, gonna I'm just going to, I'm just going to take him home. We know he appears later, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to take him into my presence. It says that he walked with God. By the way, only three men in the Old Testament are said to have walked with God. Adam walking in the cool of, gar uh, of the garden, Enoch who walked with God, and the third one is Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible says Noah walked with God. He walked with God. He is in the line of Seth. And so whatever is known of God, remember there's no Old Testament or New Testament here. None of it has been written down. Up until this point, what is known of God is passed from one generation to the other, and somewhere in that process, people begin to pray. And in the line of Seth, they begin to call out to God. Noah is in this line. Aside from Noah, though, nothing good is going on in the earth. It seems that men have turned wholesale to evil. The Lord saw, this is from Genesis again, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every intention and the thought of his heart was for evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man in the earth and it grieved him in his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the earth, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. I'm sorry I made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the Garden of Eden, where temptation and doubt and sin and curse and pain and separation mars the whole scene, a promise is given that a seed of the woman, a male seed, a son, will one day rise up to crush or to bruise the serpent's head. It's a promise in Genesis. We talked about it two weeks ago. It's the promise in Genesis that speaks of one who will come and bring victory out of this absolute disaster that has happened in the garden. It is the first glimmer of hope after the fall of man in the third chapter of Genesis. A son will come. A few chapters later, here we are at the flood. Sin has so thoroughly corrupted creation that God is about to close the chapter, and yet he sees in Noah faith. 
and he grants to Noah a means of escape. Judgment and grace. And God said, because of Noah, I'm not going to destroy them all. I'm going to make a way for Noah. I'm going to make a way for Noah. He can repopulate the earth. I'll make a, somehow I will make a way. By the way, we see this modeled also in the story of Lot and Sodom. You remember Lot goes down to Sodom, and God sends three angels, and the angels say, we've heard what's going on down there. It's so wicked, God is going to utterly destroy it. Remember when Abraham starts standing in the gap, saying, if there are, if there are this many, will you not destroy it? If there, how about this many? If you're not, and finally gets down to ten. If there's ten righteous there, will you not destroy it? What is, what is Sodom, what is Lot showing us about God? He's showing that God is gracious. He's saying, my judgment is going to be poured out, but I will provide a means of escape. Grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah is instructed to build an ark and gather a population of animal life to take in his household and all of his provisions and to be literally saved by the rising of the flood and then start again at creation. I'm not going to go into all of the flood narrative and all of that. You can read it for yourself. Some of you know it well. I'm, but I'm not going to spend time going into all of the narrative today. Uh, we often get caught up in a lot of side conversations when it comes to the flood. Uh, most of us talk about the flood in terms of wanting to prove it to the world, to prove that this really happened and, and well, this type of strata in the rock and the shows this and and we've got all of these arguments that go on and on. We get all caught up, again, looking through our microscope at what happened there, and we miss the big story of the whole deal. And so I want to take a broader look at the flood. Ark, uh, Noah was created to construct the ark. Can you imagine what a process that was? I mean, how many big boats were around in those days? something capable of carrying what that thing would have to carry? Is there, any way, is there any way that we can interpret Genesis chapter 6 without an understanding that God gave divine enablement to Noah to be able to do what he did? Because sometimes we try and argue with people, and people out in the world will say to you, well, there's, I've read that story of the ark and the flood, and that's the biggest myth I've ever seen and the biggest fable I've ever seen. And we get defensive, and before long, we're trying to defend it as though, hey, that could really happen. I've got to tell you, it couldn't happen except God enabled Noah to make it happen. He enabled him to do it. It's just like with the building of the tabernacle. What happened with the building of the tabernacle? God says, I'm putting my spirit upon Basilel. I'm going to fill him with my Holy Spirit, and he's going to have the wisdom and knowledge to craft everything just as I want it in the tabernacle. Moses didn't say, well, here's, here's, you know, here's the dimensions, and here's how we're going to lay it out, and this is what it should look like, and let me make a drawing for you. No, God, by his Spirit, filled Basilel so that he was enabled to do what God wanted. Takeaway is this. Anything that God has asked you to do, though it may seem impossible, He will empower you to do it if He's asked you to do it. He will give you the strength to do it. Otherwise, for me, Noah would have had to have been somewhat of a lion whisperer. I don't, know. I don't know what you see with Noah, but do you see Noah going out with the boys, with his sons, to go trap? What are we getting today? Well, we've got to have two zebra. Where are we going to get those? running around with butterfly nets. Do you realize that if God wanted to, if it was his desire to, because he is God, he could cause every bit of wildlife within five square miles of this church to come walking through the door in an hour. People say, well, I just don't know how all that happened. I mean, it just doesn't seem like it's a possible story. It's a plausible story if you believe in the supernatural. God enabled, God enabled Noah. And have you ever put yourself in Noah's, have you ever wondered what it was like that day as Noah's standing by the ark and he's watching from out of the bushes, here they come two by two? That had to be a moment, right? You know, welcoming them on board. You're on the Lido deck. <laughs> here come the pigs. I was hoping you guys wouldn't show up. So Noah begins this construction project, and he must have earned the cruelest, the cruelest ridicule. 
Because people would ask him. The Bible says, by the way, that Noah was a proclaimer of righteousness. So people come to Noah and they say, what are you doing? I'm building this ark. What for? For my family and also for the animals. Why? Because God is about to send judgment on the earth. He's had it. And all of men and women and animals, it's all going to be wiped out and God is starting over. How many of you would laugh? And how many of you would never share your testimony because you're afraid that somebody might look down at you or think you're strange? There's pressure for that, isn't there? You know what? I just, I, I don't want people to think this about me or think that about me. Look, Noah, as a preacher of righteousness and as a builder of the ark, there was no hiding that thing. What are you building in your backyard? What? <laughs> that? Oh, well, that's another story. How's the wife? At the appointed time, he led his family into the ark, and he closed the doors, and the rain fell, and the fountains of the deep opened up, and the ark rose. Noah and his family were saved from utter destruction as God poured out his wrath on the earth. The language is stunning. When you look at what Paul says, he characterizes the Thessalonian believers as God's people who wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The Old Testament and the flood is a type of what will happen as Jesus takes us out of this world as his wrath is poured out. Back to Genesis so this is where most Bible readers just leave the flood story and they hurry on to the New Testament. But the New Testament that testifies of Jesus will not so quickly close the chapter. Let's just look at, a, at, at three of the New Testament connections here because they all speak and they all color in portions of the big picture. First of all, in Hebrews we find in the flood there's a picture of New Testament faith. What should faith look like? It should look like, it should look like Noah. What should your faith and my faith, it should look like Noah. And here's what it says. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen. Are you aware of any events that are coming that are as yet not seen that God has spoken of in his word? He was aware of things unseen in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. He trusted God. He believed what God said about the judgment that would come. He acted upon it. And in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, his name is listed so that New Testament people could look back and say, that's what the Christian faith should look like. You want to understand what New Testament faith should look like, you cannot close up the Old Testament. You've got to go back there because they are given to us for this purpose. Noah's faith is recognized as reverent fear. Sometime I just need to preach a message on the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. We shy away from it completely because we're a grace people. Everything's about grace and God loves everybody and everybody wants a smile on their face and our services have all got to be celebration. You preach about the fear of God and everybody feels the heaviness of all of it. Brothers and sisters, the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is understanding who he is. The fear of God is respecting the king of heaven. And in losing that fear, we become profane people shallow, weak, and our behaviors are all over the map. We treat God with contempt in reverent fear. Noah said, I got a hold of something here that is powerful, powerful enough to destroy all of the earth. So he walked with reverence before God. This is, by the way, this passage in Hebrews, it's not a memorial. We don't go back and say, well, look at Noah. Look at that. It's a model. Look at Noah, and from Noah's life, how then should I live? Big difference between a memorial and a model. 
Noah believed God. And when God said that he was going to destroy the earth, Noah acted on his faith. Now, you might see merely an Old Testament example here just to encourage our faithfulness, but it is far more than that. When the author of Hebrews has completed this list, and there's a long list in Hebrews, it's completed this list of Old Testament saints, heroes of faith. When he's put the whole list together, here's what is said by the author of Hebrews in chapter 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, so this is the wrap-up of chapter 11. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, this is not your dear departed aunt or uncle who's looking down on us now. There is no evidence in the Scripture that they're watching us. My theology says that when we get to heaven, our eyes are going to be on Jesus. Who's the great cloud of witnesses? The great cloud of witnesses are the Old Testament saints who lived their lives to give witness to us. And the context tells you that. Therefore, chapter 12, therefore, what's therefore? Therefore. Therefore is chapter 11. Who's in chapter 11? The great cloud of witnesses. Who are they? All of these Old Testament saints who walked faithfully before the Lord. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Ours may be different than theirs. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Noah and all of the Old Testament heroes are witnesses that point us to Jesus. Looking to Jesus. When I consider every one of their Old Testament lives, what's the end result? All of them, if we approach them biblically, all of them are pointing to Jesus. It's all part of the same big story. So Noah and all the Old Testament heroes point us to Jesus. You say, well, this whole thing about Jesus in the Old Testament, I'm still not quite there. Well, let's look at the words of Jesus himself in John chapter 5 and verse 39 as he's arguing with the Jews, probably the Pharisees and the experts in the law, as he's arguing with the Jews, he said, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Now, wait a minute. Jesus said, you search the Scriptures thinking that in them you have life. What Scriptures were they searching? The Jews. I mean, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John haven't even been written yet when Jesus says this. It's not the epistles. It's not the book of Revelation. You search the Scriptures. What Scriptures were they searching? It was the Old Testament. It was the Torah. It was the law. You search the Scriptures. You think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Jesus said, the Old Testament is my book. You're not convinced. Okay, just a subtle amen there. Just give me a subtle amen this morning. Amen. Okay, good. Noah then is a prototype for the man or the woman in Christ. Noah's faith and obedience are models for us. So we find here a picture of New Testament faith in Noah. You say, well, if I read what Jesus said, I don't get all of that. I'm, I'm not sure that I would follow all of that. You have to understand that most of us wouldn't read in that end of the story, and I wouldn't dare give you some new meaning that I have found, that I have found in the life of Noah, because it would be faulty. Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one by the power of the Spirit who has given this revelation to the author of Hebrews who connects Noah to the New Testament and Noah pointing to Jesus. So that's where our authority is on this. But you might think it's still a little bit thin, so let's go a little bit further and look at another author. You have Peter, First Peter and Second Peter, his two letters. And in Peter, we find the flood used as a picture or a foreshadowing of Christian baptism. You say, well, I don't know that I would draw that connection. Peter does. And he does under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So there is authority in this. Here's what Peter says. 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 through 22. 
For Christ also suffered once for sins that the right, for the righteous, I'm sorry, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were, were brought safely through the water. Now here's what Peter says about the ark and this whole period of time. He says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Whoa, wait a minute. Here's Peter talking about Jesus and spirits in prison. And most of us get into the debate about spirits in prison and all of it. We get sidelined on all of that and we miss the main plain teaching that Peter's shooting at here. Peter wants the people to understand that baptism corresponds to the saving work of the ark bringing them through the flood. That's what he's saying here. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. It's a difficult passage, and it's worthy of its own message, but here we're given just a little bit of insight into Christ proclaiming his victory to spirits who, uh, wicked spirits who are, are held uh, in captivity. You have also then Paul's revelation that you put with this where Paul talks about Jesus having not only ascended into the heavens but descended into the earth where he proclaims victory. And like I say, this deserves a message in and of itself. But Peter's point here is not imprisoned spirits. And that's where we get sidetracked. Peter's point is that Noah was safely carried through the waters of the flood to safety and that his coming through the waters of the flood correspond with Christian baptism. You say, really? I read the story of Noah and there's something in there for me on baptism? Well, yes. As the ark plies through the waters, comes through the waters, and those who are in the ark step out on dry ground and they have been saved, those of us who come to Jesus Christ and we stipulate this by water baptism, as we go through that process of baptism, we, it's an outward sign of what's already taken inside. We are delivered from the wrath that is to come and we stand now in Christ Jesus. The Old Testament the Old Testament model of the ark or type of the ark is a type of salvation that's given to us. And Peter goes so far as to draw the line to Christian baptism. And by the way, he's not the, only, he's not the only one in the New Testament to take an Old Testament story and talk about New Testament concepts. Paul did the same thing in 1 Corinthians, but he did it from Exodus. He says in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, I, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Well, under the cloud, you remember the cloud that they marched out of Egypt and the cloud led them and then they passed through the sea. That's talking about the Red Sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. So the cloud and, the, and passing through the sea, Paul says this is a model of baptism. It's another way to look at baptism. He goes on and he says, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Should be an explanation point there, because most of us, when we read that, go, what? The Apostle Paul, would you agree with me that he was anointed of the Holy Spirit and inspired of the Spirit to write his letters? The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, connects Jesus to the Exodus. Therefore, I have some confidence this morning in bringing the whole message. Paul links the cloud that covered them, the seas through which they passed with baptism, links God's provision of water from the rock as a foreshadowing of Christ in communion. The food, spiritual food and spiritual drink, baptism and communion, Paul takes two thoroughly New Testament concepts and says they're not so New Testament. We have models of them here in the Old Testament so you can understand really what they're all about because the Bible is one story from beginning to end. Do we need to take an intermission? Some of you look just a little bit glazed over. I knew this series was going to be tough that way.
And I thought that maybe we'd just set up maybe coffee bars and take a break and, you know, you could just have discussion group and then we could come in again. But I knew that if I did that, I'd never get you back in the room. So I thought I'll just, especially if I started slow like this morning. So we go to the third point. From Jesus, finally from Jesus, we find in the ark, in the whole flood story, in Jesus, we find a picture of his coming. And don't dismiss this. This is from the lips of Jesus, your Savior, my Savior. This is authoritative. The 24th chapter of Matthew, verses 37 through 39, but concerning the day and hour, the day and the hour of what? That's talking about the day of the Lord. It's talking about the beginning of events that are going to culminate in God's judgment. Remember, the whole story is judgment and grace, right? But concerning the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will the coming of the, so will the, coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered into the ark and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. The fascinating thing about this passage to me is how we misread it. My impression growing up was, as it was in the days of Noah, is a reference to how wicked and evil men have become. And indeed they have. That's not, a, that's not a false statement to say that, like the days of Noah, men are evil these days. But we get all caught up in that and we miss the main point. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus' central point is not that the earth will reach some new depth of evil. That's not what he said. As a matter of fact, Jesus doesn't mention here or in Luke evil. What does he say? He says that when the last days come, men are going to be living as though nothing's going to happen. That was the whole point. The days of Noah, what were they doing? They were eating and drinking, and they were marrying and giving in marriage. And because the days are evil, and Noah's days were noted as being so evil, the way that this is interpreted in people's minds, in the last days, people are going to be evil, 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 and they're going to be eating and drinking. That certainly means alcohol. They're going to be drunk out of their minds and marrying and giving in marriage, and it's going to be a wicked, wicked day. And we miss the point altogether. The point of the Scripture is that most people will live outside of an awareness that He's coming. Are we living in the days of Noah? Yes. How many people in the church are living outside of an awareness of His coming. You say, well, I'm not sure that many. Well, where's the fear of the Lord? And I will admit, I'm the first to admit to you, I don't wake up every morning and say, Jesus is coming in. Maybe today, wow, I, I, I have to tell, I have to just be honest with you. Sometimes time will pass and my mind is not thinking along these lines that Jesus is coming. It's an easy truth to check out on, isn't it? And when we check out on that, we're miss, we miss everything. We miss, that, we miss that component that should call us to be watchful, to be vigilant, and to be fully engaged in doing the work and the will of God because He's coming. Jesus wasn't talking about how evil it would become, although those days were evil and our days were evil. He was talking about the fact that nobody's going to be looking for him. Same old, same old. By the way, this is Peter's point also. This is his point also when he says, scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They'll say, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were in the beginning. Isn't that the attitude we find in the world, let alone the church? Listen, though. For Peter says, this is from 2 Peter, for they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the, the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. That's the flood. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now 
exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment, the destruction of the ungodly. Remember, you say, well, God promised after the flood that he wouldn't destroy the earth anymore. What are you talking about God's judgment coming? He said he would never destroy the earth again by water. Fire next time. Fire next time. But there it is again, the flood. It just keeps popping up, not as an historical fact, but as a foreshadowing, a type of things which are soon to come. And what conditions will hold preeminence in the earth in the last days? What we learn from this is indifference and ignorance of the King of Heaven. This is why we grieve as we look at our nation and people say we're no longer a Christian nation or we've slipped or we've fallen and all of that is absolutely true. God is slipping away from the American consciousness. And what does it say to us? It is that it is replaced by a spiritual indifference or a spiritual ignorance. And these are sure signs to you and me as New Testament believers, sure signs to us that the days of Noah are upon us. And what should that mean to us? We should be doing what he has called us to do. We should be walking in reverent fear. We should be obedient to anything he has set before our hands to do. And we should be looking to the heavens, expecting any time now the Son of God to make his appearance. So in all of this, and wow, it's huge, isn't it? In all of this, let me just summarize this way. Jesus, Peter, and the author of Hebrews takes the flood in the Old Testament that we isolate and says, no, you can't do that. And they drag it into the New Testament and they say to us, in this story, you can see what is coming. These Old Testament truths are given to you so that you can see God's big story. So the question must be asked, how should we live? How should we live? In light of God's promise, not revealed to a single man named Noah, God's promise revealed to us in all of the Scripture. Noah had no Bible, yet he walked with God. How will we give an excuse before God with the revelation that we have in the Old and New Testament, how can we stand before him one day with the revelation that has been afforded to us? What should the church look like and what should the church live like in light of the testimony of Jesus himself and of the apostles also? Would it be fair to say that Noah's life, would it be fair to say that Noah's life was dominated, absolutely dominated by the anticipation of the flood? What happened when God told Noah about the flood? He begins to build the ark. He's a preacher of righteousness, so he's telling people God is going to judge, God is going to judge. What did he do? He acted immediately on what he believed. So would it be fair to say that Noah's life became dominated by the impending doom that was coming after God spoke to him? Isn't it fair to say that we as Christians should be dominated by this one understanding that Jesus is coming again? Isn't it unthinkable that the expectation of his soon return is not that much higher in the church than it is in the unbelieving world? Shouldn't that concern us? That eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage and going on like we've always gone on without an awareness that he could come at any time? See, Noah gave himself to one pursuit, to move in obedience to God and be ready. Where are the Noahs of our day? See, if I were crafting this message looking for that one takeaway, this is how I would wrap it up. Be Noah. You found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Jesus has saved you. He has given you this marvelous gift. Now live like that. Build your ark. You say, well, he hasn't told me to build an ark. What has he told you to do? 
And I, I've got a book that's about this thick that you can read through and you'll find what God has told you to do. It's full of all kinds of instruction. The Bible instructs us from Genesis to Revelation how we should live. I would say to you, you have been given this grace. God has spoken to you. So what should you do? Obey Him. Listen for Him. Move according to His plan. Do what He says. I'm growing more and more convinced that this generation, even within the church, loves what is to be lost and has lost their concept of what is to be gained. This world's not our home. We're citizens of another place. And we await our king from there. Do you? Do we? Well, Christ is not absent. The Old Testament, the flood, that cataclysm in the Old Testament shouts at the church in this day. But is anybody listening? Christ is coming with judgment but he has come even now with salvation and are you living as though that's true Noah had no Bible and yet he walked in righteousness think about that and ask the question how then should I live how then should I live would you stand with me and bow your heads? Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts about the way we live in light of the Bible's great story. Help us, Lord. 